This MOOPL series of Texas A&M University is provided through Project Listo. Literacy infused science using technology innovation opportunities. The video series is comprised of experts in the field talking about their research while making important contributions to the art of teaching in the K-12 environment. Project Listo is funded through a competitive I-3 grant from the U.S. Department of Education investing in innovation program. The Listo Project is a collaboration among the Center for Research and Development in Dual Language and Literacy Acquisition, Education Leadership Research Center, and Aggie STEM. I was asked by Aggie STEM from Texas A&M University to talk about the issue of scientific practices. My interest in science as culture and practice stemmed from my experience teaching in Togo, West Africa in the late 1980s. After college, I joined the Peace Corps and taught high school physics and chemistry to Togolese students in French. This was the second language for me and one of the multiple languages spoken by my students. As we discussed science concepts, my students also posed questions that led me to think deeply and differently about scientific knowledge and cultural practice. For example, while the physics I taught rested on a universe of physical forces and materials, my students include in their worldview an active world of spirits. Over time, I realized that science rests on a number of important assumptions about nature. I decided to continue examining some of these basic assumptions of science by attending graduate school. I chose Cornell because the university emphasizes and indeed requires interdisciplinary research. I took courses in education, but also mathematics, physics, industrial labor relations, and economics. Most important, perhaps, were the courses I studied in epistemology, philosophy of science, and sociology of science. I read work by anthropologists and sociologists who studied the workings of science labs and described scientists as a foreign tribe and sought to describe these microcultures. These different lenses prompted me to ask questions about what counted as science, who creates science, and how science is created. To answer these questions, I began to think about the work that scientists do as they construct scientific knowledge. All people belong to a number of communities. These communities have ways of being that determine how you behave. There are practices of the community. Science has certain acceptable practices, but so does a church choir or a bowling league. For example, in bowling, there are formalized practices such as turn taking and scoring, and the types of shoes you're allowed to wear and informal practices such as where you stand when other teammates are bowling. Scientists and engineers also engage in a variety of practices that govern their work and interactions. For example, they use specific protocols to conduct experiments and tests. They learn to keep their lunch in a different refrigerator than their specimens. Sometimes they wear lab coats and goggles to protect their clothing and eyes. They analyze and write up research using established formats and they create new knowledge by subjecting their findings to peer review. All of these are scientific practices, but only some of these directly create new knowledge. We call these epistemic practices of science, or epistemic practices of engineering. Epistemic means knowledge producing. So there are knowledge producing practices of science. It is these epistemic practices that I study. Finally, I want to mention one more important feature of epistemic practices. Some of these practices are unique to specific disciplines, while others may be present across a number of disciplines. For example, careful observation is a practice in physics, archaeology, and art. In each of these disciplines, scholars learn to observe different ways to create new knowledge. So while observing is a common practice, is employed differently. In the early 1990s, as a new faculty member, I began to study how students and teachers construct science and engineering knowledge and practices in classrooms. To do so, I needed to think about how to examine everyday life in these classrooms. Classrooms are complex social places. Students learn from and with each other. Recognizing that developing knowledge and facility with practices are social processes, I sought to understand how students and teachers talk and interact. I was interested, therefore, in social practices. Social practices are patterned sets of actions that are typically performed by members of a group. These are rooted in common purposes and expectations and employ shared cultural values, tools, and meanings. For example, students who are investigating a following object 
learn to record and represent their numerical data in a data table that follows standardized conventions. You'll note that the social aspect of this investigation would include both interacting with other people, but also the history of collective knowledge that determined what are the acceptable ways to create a data table. That is, the history of ideas is part of the social knowledge. As students engage in social practices, they rely on multiple forms of discourse, such as spoken language, uses of signs and symbols, and gesture and body language. To study how students were creating their understandings of science and engineering, I decided I would look at these multiple modes of communication, also known as their discourse. Now I'm going to explain some key concepts that I rely on for my research, discourse, practice, social practice, and epistemic practices. Let's see how we can use these to understand how students make sense of their world. We'll look at a fourth grade classroom of students engaging in epistemic practices through an engineering design challenge. The students are engaged in an engineering as elementary aerospace engineering unit. You can find this at eie.org. In this curricular unit, the students design, test, and improve a parachute using age-appropriate engineering design process. Ask, imagine, plan, create, and improve. Prior to the lesson that we will observe, the students have read a storybook that sets a context for the design challenge. They would design a parachute that falls as slowly as possible. They have learned about the parts of the parachute, the canopy, suspension lines, and load. They have investigated how key variables affect the rate at which the parachutes fall by testing the canopy material, the canopy size, and the suspension lines. They have worked in small groups to design, build, and test a prototype. Having returned to the classroom with their data, it's time for the students to analyze and make sense of it. In the video clip, we will see students are sharing data across groups and comparing their results. The creation of a class data table that compiles the data from each group allows students to analyze trends across a larger pool of data and consider and learn from what other groups have done as they redesign their own parachutes to make them better. The students have completed the create phase of the engineering design process and are now pooling their knowledge to prepare for the improved phase of redesign. There are a number of epistemic practices of engineering, science, and math that students engage in during this video. I invite you to focus on three of them, applying mathematical knowledge to problem solving, making evidence-based decisions, and communicating effectively to construct a solution. Before you improve, let's share our data with one another. Do you, did all of the parachutes shoots fall the same way? No. Did, were some slower than others? Let's think about why. Let's try to think about why before you start to improve your parachute design. Okay? So, I want you to look at your data, and this is the two things I want you to think about. Number one, what is the average drop speed? So let's talk about the average drop speed. Does everybody understand what that actually means? How about this? Anybody understand what that means? Julia. I think that's just telling you for how many feet you went per second. Yes. How many feet in every second? Number two, the canopy diameter. If my radius was seven, what was my diameter? Doa. 14. 14. And number three, what was your team's suspension line length? But I want to know this, the suspension line length. Got that? Three things. Average drop speed, diameter of your canopy, and suspension line length. I'll give you 10 seconds to talk to your team and pick one person to share out with me. Uh, team one, average drop speed. 2.7. Two. Point seven. Ooh, is that good? Look at this. I thought that was good. That's better than that. All right, I want you to look at this. Can everybody see the data? Yeah. All right, look at it for one minute, and I want you to talk about, with your team, is there any connection or correlation between these two things and this? So look at it for a minute and then have a conversation at your group. Do you think there's any connection between them? Yeah. 
So these were the slow, would we agree that these two were the slow, uh, the faster ones? That they need the most improvement? Okay, how can we compare these to the other ones? Anything you noticed? Noor. I noticed that the people who had sh shorter suspension lines and bigger canopies had um, lower uh, average drop speed. Okay. As a class, the students were working to understand how parachute variables impact their descent. The teacher opened the clip by stating, before you improve, let's share out our data with one another. This signaled to the students that the data collected in small groups would be part of the classroom conversation. A key part of the analysis of the respective parachute designs is the assessment of the drop speed. The drop speed is related to the three key variables the students had previously identified, the canopy material, the canopy size, and the suspension line lengths. To understand the relationship among variables, the teacher had her students share their numerical data. They calculated the rate of descent so they could compare results across groups. And with respect to a set criterion, they were aiming to design a parachute that falls slower than five feet per second. In this example, they share data on a table so all students can make inferences from the data from each group. This was the beginning of the epistemic practice of making evidence-based decisions. To use the evidence effectively, the students needed to apply mathematical knowledge about rate and averages to understand how the relevant variables influence the drop rate. This is the practice of applying mathematical knowledge to solve problems. Finally, through the process of making inferences about designs, the students needed to communicate. Discourse practices are an important part of science and engineering. In this case, the students needed to communicate in small groups to calculate their results and then share with the whole class. As a class, they use conventionalized practices, such as a data table and symbolic representation of the parachute. Throughout the episode, the practice of communicating effectively to construct a solution is evident. Of course, these are only three epistemic practices. There are many others, even in this short excerpt. Knowledge in science and engineering is constructed through discourse and engagement in such epistemic practices. Why should educators care about practices? My goal has been to demystify science and engineering through the study of everyday educational events. I'm particularly interested in how we can make science and engineering accessible to a more diverse group of people. Epistemic practices is important because it is through meaningful engagement with these that students come to not only understand how scientific or engineering knowledge is created, but also because they learn to see themselves as capable of doing science or engineering. Through the process of engaging in epistemic practices, they learn the importance of making evidence-based decisions. I believe that teaching practices is best done through purposeful engagement and meaningful activity. Science and engineering practices, and in particular epistemic practices, provide important ways to think about student engagement. There is a clear social component to this work. Students are working together with each other, with their teacher, and they're using accepted norms of science and engineering communities. I want to close by pointing out some of the features of the educational activity in the video that allow for meaningful engagement with practices. Almost all science and engineering teaching involves practices. The real questions are what practices, how purposeful they are, and what is the quality of the learning opportunities provided. For example, a teacher lecturing from a PowerPoint deck can engage students in the practice of recording definitions of scientific terms in their notebooks. This would not be a scientific or epistemic practice, although it might be a school practice. In contrast, in the video I showed, the activity provided numerous educational opportunities. Let's consider four of these. First, the problem space allowed for multiple solutions. There is no singular best or correct parachute design. Instead, the problem invited students to exercise their creativity. Second, the solution was based in science. The students conducted multiple trials and systematically explored variables. They shared their results with the class for review and analysis, and these conversations were grounded in data. Third, the student groups were held accountable to the empirical results, to other members of their group, 
and to their classmates. Fourth, students were engaged in multiple iterations of design and improvement. They analyzed the data for a reason. The activity provided an opportunity to use what they learned to improve their next design iteration. So the many practices were tied together in an overall educational experience that was coherently organized around purposeful activity and specific learning goals. My research program over the last 25 years has demonstrated that such opportunities create powerful learning experiences for students. <laughs>